York. This is Democracy Now! In this midterm election, American democracy hangs in the balance. Our vote is going to determine whether we have control over our own bodies, whether we are able to vote and have our votes count, whether we will have a clean environment, whether we will be able to live into our fullness. With the midterm elections 10 days away, we go to Georgia to speak to Emory Professor Carol Anderson about what's at stake in this pivotal election that will decide who controls Congress. Plus, we talk to Ari Berman about his new Mother Jones cover story, how Wisconsin became the GOP's laboratory for dismantling democracy. We're at a very scary time for democracy, where people that don't believe in free and fair elections could take over our election system. And what happens in states like Wisconsin in 2022 will determine whether we have fair elections in 2024. Then Florida voting rights activist Desmond Mead on how Republican Governor Ron DeSantis is attempting to scare former felons away from voting by using his newly formed election police force to arrest people on trumped up voter fraud charges. Oh my God. So, ultimately, ma'am, you have a warrant? Okay. The warrant. Listen, hold on, listen. I know you're, and you caught off guard, I understand. Right? So, you have a warrant. It's for voter fraud, okay? All that and more coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Russian President Vladimir Putin said Thursday, the world faces the most dangerous and unpredictable decade since the end of World War II, even as he insisted the war in Ukraine was going according to plan. Over the course of a four-hour appearance at a foreign policy conference in Moscow, Putin said Russia stands ready for a negotiated end to the conflict in Ukraine, but insisted Ukraine and its allies are not willing to engage in diplomacy. He also railed against Western powers, comparing them to Nazi Germany. The disintegration of the Soviet Union destroyed the balance of geopolitical powers. The West felt it was the victor and declared a unipolar world order in which only its will, its culture, its interest had the right to exist. Now, this historic period of Western dominance and world affairs is coming to an end. In Kyiv, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky warned in a televised address Thursday, much of Ukraine will face extended blackouts after Russia launched a series of attacks on energy infrastructure. Zelensky spoke from a darkened street next to the wreckage of what he said was an Iranian-made drone used in recent assaults. He said Ukraine had shot down 300 of the drones and that Russia has launched more than 8,000 airstrikes and 4,500 missiles since it invaded in February. The Biden administration has released its nuclear power posture review for 2022, with anti-nuclear groups warning the document will do little to prevent the threat of a catastrophic war. The document proposes cutting some programs, like a submarine-launched nuclear cruise missile system begun under former President Trump. However, the White House is pressing ahead with a so-called modernization plan aimed at upgrading the U.S. arsenal, currently estimated about 5,400 nuclear warheads last year. The Congressional Budget Office estimated those programs will cost more than $630 billion this decade alone. The Union of Concerned Scientists said in a statement, quote, President Biden could have used the nuclear posture review to dramatically decrease the risk of nuclear war by declaring that the United States will never start a nuclear war and ending the president's sole authority to launch a nuclear strike. These changes would immediately reduce the risk of a misunderstanding miscalculation or flat-out mistake leading to a world-changing nuclear war, they said. Voters in Brazil head to the polls Sunday for a runoff election that pits far-right President Jair Bolsonaro against former leader Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva. Polls have shown Lula with a slender but consistent lead. Ahead of the vote, Bolsonaro's son, Rio State Senator Flavio Bolsonaro, claimed his father was the victim of, quote, the greatest electoral fraud ever seen, unquote. 
attempts by the Bolsonaro family and their allies to sow doubt over the election have added to fears that Bolsonaro will attempt to stage a coup d'etat if he loses. Those concerns grew this week after authorities in Rio de Janeiro charged a former Congress member and Bolsonaro ally with attempted murder after he attacked federal police officers with a rifle and grenade as they sought to arrest him Sunday. Bolsonaro has since tried to distance himself from the former Congress member, Roberto Jefferson, even though several photographs taken in 2020 show the pair laughing and smiling together. Meanwhile, environmentalists fear what a Bolsonaro victory could mean for the climate crisis. What Brazilians do now at the polls is much more than a change of president. These are fundamental choices for our country, choices for the future. We will choose whether we stay with democracy or not. We will have to choose if we keep the Amazon alive or if we keep Bolsonaro. It's a choice between the two. It's not going to be possible to have both at the same time. Canada has sent a delegation to Haiti to assess security and humanitarian concerns as Haiti faces worsening political instability and gang activity. Canada's foreign minister and prime minister Justin Trudeau met with U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken in Ottawa Thursday as the two countries push for an international armed intervention in Haiti. Haitians have taken to the streets in recent weeks, denouncing foreign aid and occupation, saying the U.S. and other foreign powers have contributed to the destabilization of Haiti. Protesters are also demanding the resignation of the U.S.-backed Haitian Prime Minister Ariel Henry. Meanwhile, a group of Democratic senators, led by Massachusetts Senator Ed Markey, are urging the Biden administration to expand and extend temporary protected status—that's TPS—for Haitians as thousands continue to flee to the United States. Haiti's current TPS designation expires in February. The Biden administration has continued to mass deport Haitians asylum seekers, including children, despite widespread shortages of food, water and other vital resources. In related news, hundreds of thousands of immigrants from El Salvador, Honduras, Nicaragua and Nepal who have TPS are at risk of deportation after negotiations with the Biden administration to expand the relief collapsed earlier this week. Talks have been ongoing for over a year as part of litigation demanding the U.S. government redesignate TPS for more than 260,000 people. In 2020, a federal appeals court reversed an injunction from 2018 that had blocked termination of their relief. That decision is not yet final, as plaintiffs await another hearing. But people could lose their protections as early as the end of the year if the Biden administration continues to defend the Trump-era decision. In Austin, Texas, families of victims of the massacre in Uvalde packed a public safety commission meeting Thursday to demand the resignation of Texas's top law enforcement official over the botched police response during the mass shooting and the mishandling of the investigation that followed. Newly released body cam footage shows Texas law enforcement officers at Robb Elementary School on May 24th acknowledging they should confront the gunman but saying they were afraid of getting shot. Nineteen students and two of their teachers were killed that day, as over 70 minutes passed before police finally entered the fourth-grade classroom and killed the gunman. Democratic State Senator Roland Gutierrez, who represents Uvalde, spoke at Thursday's meeting. No help arrived. We'll never know how many children could have been saved. Two, three, four. A few died on the way to the hospital. Eva Mireles died on the way to the hospital. The actions by DPS and the aftermath of the shooting are nearly as egregious as their inaction on May 24th. To see our interview with Texas State Senator Gutierrez, go to democracynow.org. Elon Musk has reportedly closed his $44 billion purchase of Twitter and has fired the company's top executives, including its CEO and CFO. Musk changed his Twitter bio to read Chief Twit and tweeted, quote, the bird is freed late Thursday. Twitter employees have expressed fears Musk would slash its existing workforce by 75 percent. Meanwhile, many are expecting Elon Musk to reinstate Donald Trump's account, which was permanently suspended after the January 6th insurrection. 
In New Jersey, a federal prosecutor has issued dozens of subpoenas in a wide-ranging criminal investigation involving several people, including U.S. Senator Robert Menendez. That's according to NBC News, which reports the investigation also involves a company that's authorized by the government of Egypt to certify exports of halal food worldwide. Menendez is a Democrat and chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. In 2017, prosecutors dropped corruption charges against him, after a jury couldn't agree on a verdict. In that case, Senator Menendez was accused of influence peddling on behalf of a New Jersey ophthalmologist in exchange for flights on a private jet, luxury, hotel stays and six-figure campaign contributions. The U.S. Centers for Disease Control is warning communities of color are far less likely to benefit from potentially life-saving treatments for COVID-19. A CDC study released Thursday found African American and Latinx patients received the antiviral drug Paxlovid more than 30 percent less often than white patients, even though people of color in the U.S. are about twice as likely to be hospitalized with COVID. This comes as U.S. coronavirus hospitalizations have begun to increase for the first time since. July. In Uganda, more than a dozen people, including six school children, have tested positive for the Ebola virus in the capital, Kampala. It's part of a new outbreak of the disease, which has seen over 100 confirmed infections and 30 deaths in Uganda since the first case emerged in September. It's the fifth outbreak of Ebola in Uganda since 2000. In Pakistan, tens of thousands of people attended the funeral of prominent journalist Arshad Sharif in Islamabad Thursday. Sharif was killed by police in Kenya Sunday, in what authorities claim was a case of a mistaken identity. Sharif had fled Pakistan just two months before his death to avoid arrest following a series of criminal charges over his criticism of the Pakistani military and the government of Prime Minister Shabazz Sharif, who rose to power after the ouster of Imran Khan. Arshad Sharif had been living in hiding in Kenya. Supporters are demanding justice for Sharif and a thorough and independent investigation into his killing. Pakistan has a history of media suppression and violence against journalists and critics often blame the military. In the Philippines, landslides and flooding have killed at least 31 people, while others remain missing as rains from tropical storm Nalgi lash the central and southern Visayas and Mindanao regions. Authorities warn more flooding could be on its way as the storm makes landfall this weekend in northern Philippines. And in Mexico. Same-sex marriage is now legal across the whole country after the states of Guerrero and Tamaulipas legalized marriage equality this week. Same-sex couples can now get married in all 32 Mexican states. This is LGBTQ activist Denise Mercado celebrating the news Wednesday. Tamaulipas said yes to marriage, said yes to love and yes to our families, and also that we have the same rights as other families. We are not, quote, unnatural. On the contrary, we have existed throughout history. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Former President Barack Obama's campaigning in Georgia today in an effort to help Democrats in the closely watched Georgia Senate and gubernatorial races. Democratic Senator Raphael Warnock is in a tight race with Herschel Walker, a Trump-backed anti-abortion Republican who's been immersed in numerous scandals, ranging from reports he paid girlfriends to have abortions to lying to his own staff about the number of children he secretly had. On Thursday, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer was heard and on a hot mic telling President Biden the race is, quote, going downhill for the Democrats. Meanwhile, polls show Democrat Stacey Abrams is trailing Georgia's Republican Governor Brian Kemp in a rematch of their 2018 gubernatorial race. In the coming days, Obama is also scheduled to campaign in Michigan, in Wisconsin, in Nevada, and Pennsylvania, all key battleground states. Meanwhile, President Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris are holding a rare joint campaign event in Pennsylvania today to help boost Democratic senator or Senate candidate John Fetterman, who's in a close race with the Trump-backed Mehmet Oz. Democrats are hoping to capitalize on Oz's comment at this week's debate that abortion should be decided between, quote, women, doctors, local political leaders.
Meanwhile, questions continue to swirl about Fetterman's health as he recovers from a stroke suffered just days before the primary. With the midterms less than two weeks away, today we spend the hour looking at what's at stake and what it could mean for the 2024 presidential race. The Washington Post recently reported 291 Republicans on the ballot in congressional and statewide races have denied or questioned the outcome of the 2020 presidential election. We begin in Georgia, where we're joined by Carol Anderson, professor at Emory University, author of The Second, Race and Guns in a Fatally Unequal America. She's also the author of one person, no vote, how voter suppression is destroying our democracy, and white rage, the unspoken truth of our racial divide. Professor Anderson, it's great to have you back on Democracy Now! Can you talk about, first, the broad picture? What's at stake in these midterm elections? And then talk about where you are in the state of Georgia that could determine so much. What's at stake is American democracy, because, as you noted, there are 291 election deniers on the ballot. And these are the folks who were really fine with the big lie, that there was this massive, rampant voter fraud that stole the election from Donald Trump and refused to acknowledge that there is no evidence of widespread, rampant voter fraud. Instead, what they've, they've done is they've conjured up these notions of people of color stealing the election, stuffing ballot boxes, stuffing drop boxes, um, forging absentee ballots, the whole nine yards without evidence, the kind of not evidence that uh, led to Rudy Giuliani having his law license suspended from New York and Washington, D.C. So when you have these folks on the ballot, it means that if they gain control and they're running for the governorship, they're running as for secretary of state, they're running for attorney general. What that means is that these are the folks who have their hands on the levers of power that determine how an election is certified. And so it, it's like that the after 2020, that this was a dry run as they tried fake electors, as they tried as the Trump folks try putting enormous pressure on these state officials. And you had some state officials who, who said, no, we're not doing that, because they were trying to erase millions and millions of votes for Joseph Biden. And if they win, it means then that the certification of elections for 2024, the presidential election, cannot really be certified because they are going to put in power who they want, not who the people have voted for. So let's talk about the races in Georgia. First, mm. let's go to Kemp versus Stacey Abrams. Now, and the national significance, even of this gubernatorial race, it's a rematch. Um, and I think Kemp has very much been portrayed nationally um, as uh, the person, the Republican, who stood up, along with the secretary of state in Georgia, to President Trump, um, to around the issue of the 2020 election. Um, but in Georgia, can you talk about his history with voter suppression? Right. You know, so when Brian Kemp was the secretary of state, he went after a group of, of black women in Quitman, Georgia, because they had discerned how to use absentee ballots, and they were able then to gain uh, access. They were able to win elections to the school board. And so voter fraud, voter fraud, voter fraud was plastered by Brian Kemp. And you see the newspaper that has what's called the equipment 10 plus two uh, above the fold, all in their orange traveling jumpsuits, just making it really clear. Black folks use absentee ballots. It must be fraudulent. And he brought the Georgia Bureau of Investigation in there to, to, to investigate this voter fraud. There were no convictions. The charges were dropped. But these women went through four years of, of hell um, of, 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 and then losing their jobs. And, and, and this was the pressure, the intimidation that Brian Kemp brought onto these women. He also did the same thing with the New Georgia Project and with Fair Fight. Again, 
charging voter fraud, voter fraud, voter fraud. And these are organizations that are about really registering folks to vote, those who had not been in the system, the marginalized. And so you see this pressure. So we've got Brian Kemp on tape saying, you know, these groups are all out here registering all these minorities to vote. And if they show up in November, we will lose. And so you get the sense where the secretary of state has identified minorities as the way that the Republicans will lose. Let's turn to Stacey Abrams at a debate against Brian Kemp earlier this month. But let's be clear about ballot access and voter access. Brian Kemp was the secretary of state, and he has assiduously denied access to the right to vote. We know that the right to vote is the only way that we can make the changes we need in the state, the only way we can make the changes we need in this country, whether it's access to the right to an abortion, the ability to take care of our families. We need a governor who believes in access to the right to vote right. and not in voter suppression, which is the hallmark of Brian Kemp's leadership. Your response. She nailed it. Absolutely. Um, one of the key th pieces that he did was the massive voter roll purges, over half a million in one fell swoop. Um, and then in October of 2018, on the last day of voter registration, using a racially discriminatory policy called exact match, removed 53,000 voters from the rolls. And fewer than 10% of those that he removed were white. The vast majority, 70%, were African-American. And this is a month before his, the, the election date between him and, and Stacey Abrams in 2018. So I want to turn to the senatorial race. Um, the new ad by Senator Reverend Raphael Warnock about his opponent, Herschel Walker. I'm Raphael Warnock, and I approve this message. For you, Herschel Walker wants to ban abortion. I have no exception in my mind. I can say I believe in life. There's not a national ban on abortion right now, and I think that's a problem. But for himself? Herschel Walker paid for an abortion for his then-girlfriend. She supported her claims with a $575 receipt from the abortion clinic. Even his own son is saying Walker is lying. Is that your signature uh, on the oh. chat, though? Yes, that's my... So that's the ad. Um, and, by the way, another woman has come forward to claim anti-abortion Republican Senate candidate Herschel Walker pressured her into having an abortion as well. She's unidentified. She said it happened in the 90s while they were dating, and that Walker drove her to the clinic to have the procedure. On Wednesday, her lawyer, Gloria Allred, spoke to the press about her client's allegations and played audio tape of the woman. Herschel Walker is a hypocrite and he is not fit to be a U.S. Senator. We don't need people in the U.S. Senate who profess one thing and do another. Herschel Walker says he is against women having abortions, but he pressured me to have one. And the significance, of course, of this, Professor Anderson, is that he supports a almost total ban on abortion. Uh, so talk about this race overall, which doesn't just involve abortion, though it's certainly this issue has come front and center. His son has come out against him. He talked about um, being a police officer, showing a sheriff's badge. Well, you can lay it out for us. Wow. And, and so what we have to remember is that Herschel Walker was tapped by Donald Trump when Herschel Walker was living in Texas to run for the U.S. Senate here in Georgia. And so it's so cynical because Raphael Warnock is African-American. And so you can see in the kind of cynicism of, of Donald Trump, well, Herschel Walker's black and he was a big football star at Georgia. Let's pit him against Raphael Warnock. They won't be able to tell the difference. There is a fundamental qualitative difference between the two. Herschel Walker lies. He lied about his graduation. He lied about his businesses. He lied about being a law enforcement officer, about being in the FBI. He lies, he lies, he lies. And remember when the issue about how many children he had started coming out, there was an incredible report about how his staff had asked him, are there any more children? He's like, no. And then another one would pop up. 
Are there any more children? No. And then another one would pop up. And so his own staff didn't trust him. Yet they're asking us to vote for him, to trust him with our lives in the U.S. Senate. And so what we're seeing here is that Herschel Walker really plays to the stereotype of who the Republicans believe African-American men are, that they're sexually promiscuous, that they're violent, because, you know, he held a gun to his wife's head and threatened to blow her brains out, that they are liars, that they aren't smart. They're all brains, no, they're all brawn, no brains. I mean, all of these stereotypes and what they know about Herschel Walker is that he is pliable, that he will do what they say. So with those stereotypes, they've got all of the horrible stereotypes and they've got that actual stereotype coming back from the slavery days of being compliant. Um, and, and that is who they're trying to foist upon us in this election. And what this means for who controls the Senate and because what we know about the control of the Senate is that we're, that's where judiciary appointments are, are, are come through. We know that that's where voting rights come through and were blocked this last time. We know that that's where the right to reproductive rights comes through. And so who controls the Senate has so much to do about the quality of the lives that we will be able to lead and to to foist Herschel Walker up there as a viable candidate is and, unconscionable. And of course, it was Georgia that determined the balance of the Senate this time around, with both Senators Ossoff and Warnock winning, um, uh, to the surprise of many last time around. Um, I also want to bring Ari Berman into this conversation, one of the leading journalists covering voting rights, reporter at Mother Jones, author of Give Us the Ballot, The Modern Struggle for Voting Rights in America. Ari, uh, before we go to our second segment with you to talk about Wisconsin, if you can talk more about you're just back from Georgia, um, what you found as you um, traveled there. Well, thank you for having me again, Amy, and great to be on uh, with Carol. Uh, one of the things that happened is that in the last year, uh, Georgia passed a law that severely restricted voting rights. And this has led to a lot of uncertainty in the states. We saw that vote by mail has gone down dramatically in Georgia during this election. Part of that is because some people are gonna vote in person now that we're in a different phase of the pandemic, but it's also because vote by mail has become a lot more difficult now than it was before. We've seen tens of thousands of voters have their eligibility challenged by Trump-backed election deniers, which has led to a major level of uncertainty in terms of whether votes will be counted. A lot of people are voting early, which is a good thing. There's been record early voting turnout. But then that record early voting turnout has been spun by Republicans to say, oh, there's record turnout. There's no such thing as voter suppression, as opposed to the fact that the record turnout is an example of how folks are navigating the barriers of voter suppression. Then there's the fact that Brian Kemp has a long history of voter suppression. He has a very extreme record when it comes to issues like abortion, guns, et cetera. But he is getting a tremendous amount of credit and basically a complete free pass from the media simply for certifying the 2020 election, like every other Democratic and Republican governor did in 2020. So Brian Kemp has been lauded by the media as this defender of democracy, even though he systematically has undermined voting rights, first as secretary of state in 2018, where he was both secretary of state and a candidate for governor, which undermined all sorts of democratic norms. And then last year, when he signed the voter suppression law that became a template for voter suppression all across the country. And so I think that Stacey Abrams is struggling to deal with that perception of Kemp, because even though he's very extreme, he is being portrayed as more of a moderate simply for doing his job, which every other governor in America did. 
And finally, Carol Anderson, you not only look at Georgia, um, but as a voting rights expert, have been looking at races across the country. Can you talk about Arizona, where Carrie Lake, um, who is running for governor there, um, said that she will only accept the elections if she wins? And, and that has been the mantra of these election deniers who are running for office, that the only viable election, the only valid election is one in which they win. That's not democracy. That's autocracy. Um, and, and she really is like Donald Trump in a kind of gussied up fashion, um, more polished, um, more photogenic. And so it doesn't look as horrific, but it is equally as horrific as Donald Trump. And that, and remember that Donald Trump's big lie, that he lost the election, that it was stolen from him, is what led to the insurrection, the invasion at the Capitol on January 6th, the attempt to overthrow the U.S. government. That's where this leads. Let's remember that um, the Secretary of State Hobbs, who's running against her on the Democratic line, um, had just had her campaign offices broken into. The kind of violence that election deniers generate, because it plays to a sense of grievance that something valuable is being stolen from them, is what creates this 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 destabilization in the system. It creates a level of distrust. Um, it's how Ari talked about the massive voter challenges, voter registration challenges that are happening. Gwinnett County here in, in Georgia, the most diverse county in the state, had over 37,000 voters challenged by these right-wingers who are funded by Michael Flynn and Patrick Byrne. And so this is Michael what's Flynn, at stake when the you have this kind of lack Trump of credibility. The Boom. former Trump national security advisor, Michael Flynn. Yes, the former national security advisor, Michael Flynn. His organization is helping to fund the group that is challenging these voter registrations across the state, particularly in the Atlanta metro area and the other counties that have strong uh, cities. Well, I want to thank you both for being with us. Carol Anderson is professor at Emory University, author of a number of books, including The Second, Race and Guns in a Fatally Unequal America, and One Person, No Vote, How Voter Suppression is Destroying Our Democracy, another book, White Rage, The Unspoken Truth of Our Racial Divide. We also want to ask Ari Berman to stay with us so that you can talk more about your new Mother Jones cover story, how Wisconsin became the GOP's laboratory for dismantling democracy. Stay with us. Every time I sing this song, I sing for My Georgia Oh, oh, Georgia Get it hold me through This old sweet song Keeps Georgia on my mind Georgia on My Mind by Ray Charles. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. We continue our conversation with Ari Berman, one of the leading journalists covering voting rights, reporter at Mother Jones, author of Give Us the Ballot, The Modern Struggle for Voting Rights in America. His new cover story is headlined, How Wisconsin Became the GOP's Laboratory for Dismantling Democracy. Ari, can you lay out what you found? Yeah, absolutely, Amy, and thank you for having me on to discuss this. So really, Wisconsin is a case study for how Republicans 
are dismantling democracy in real time right now, but also it's a project that dates back over a decade uh, where Republicans have tried to create a situation where their majorities are voter proof, that they control the state no matter what happens uh, politically. So first, it was the election of Scott Walker in 2011 and the union busting, the voter suppression, the dismantling of the state's campaign finance system. Then it was the extreme gerrymandering that has basically put Republicans in control of the state legislature for the past decade. They passed the most gerrymandered maps in the country in 2011. Last year in 2021, they passed even more gerrymandered maps. Now Republicans in the state legislature are on the verge of a supermajority in the state, which would allow them to be able to override the veto of Democratic Governor Tony Evers if he's reelected. And what we have in Wisconsin is a paradox. It's a 50-50 swing state, but in the state legislature, they're on the verge of a two-thirds Republican supermajority, meaning that the legislature is completely out of step with the rest of the state, and they have refused to pass popular policies like expanding Medicaid, like background checks for guns. They refuse to repeal an abortion ban from 1849 that makes no exceptions for rape or incest. And in the Dobbs decision, Justice Samuel Alito said that we need to return the issue of abortion to the people's elected representatives. But what Wisconsin has shown is just how disconnected the people's representatives are from the people themselves. So talk more about this, what this gerrymandering represents, and how Wisconsin has often been a laboratory for the country, from welfare to this kind of gerrymandering, and then how this fits into another very closely watched race, uh, the senator race, uh, that could be flipped, not clear, by Mandela Barnes as he challenges Ron Johnson. Well, it's important to note that Wisconsin has had a long progressive history for many years. It was a state that had the blueprint for policies like Social Security, for collect bargaining rights, for the direct election of U.S. senators uh, back in the early 1900s. Under Scott Walker, it became a laboratory for anti-democratic conservatism. Again, tons of money from places like the Bradley Foundation, to try to privatize schools, to dismantle unions, to dismantle campaign finance laws, to suppress votes. And that has accelerated dramatically with the extreme gerrymandering that we're seeing. Basically, what Republicans can do in Wisconsin is they can nullify the will of the voters. They don't have to pass popular policies. They can do extreme things. And they feel like there's no accountability. And routinely, Democrats get more votes than Republicans, but Republicans have these huge majorities in the state legislature. In 2018, for example, Democrats won all five statewide elections in Wisconsin, including for governor. They got 53 percent of the vote for the state assembly, but Democrats only got 36 percent of seats. And so right now, there's a competitive race for governor. There's a competitive race for the U.S. Senate. But Republicans could be on the verge of getting two-thirds majorities in the legislature. And that's a really scary situation for democracy, because what that means is that, essentially, the heavy, heavily gerrymandered legislature, which has no accountability, could be in charge of running elections in the state. And that poses a grave danger to fair elections in 2024. So you've written about how what the Republican plan is um, for one-party rule this year. Explain. Well, basically, what Republicans want to do is they want to take control in 2022 in key swing states like Wisconsin so that Trump's coup will succeed in 2024. You'll remember that Trump asked Republican state legislatures in places like Wisconsin to overturn the will of the voters. They didn't do that because in some cases they don't have the power to do that. In Wisconsin, the governor certifies the presidential election. What Republicans want to do is they want to get a two-thirds supermajority in Wisconsin so the ultra-gerrymandered legislature will instead be in charge of certifying elections. And that could potentially mean they could overthrow the popular vote in these 
states. And so I think it's really important to note that these state races in 2022, who's elected governor, secretary of state, attorney general, but also who controls the legislatures, is going to have a huge impact on whether we will have a fair election in 2024. And I think a lot of people only pay attention to presidential elections. But if you overlook these midterms, it's going to be too late. And what happens in the states has a huge impact what happens nationally as well. Wisconsin has become the laboratory for dismantling democracy, not just in the state, but nationwide. The voter suppression, the union busting, the attacks on campaign finance laws, these are things that happen in Wisconsin then were exported to other states to become not just a state model, but a national model as well. So what's happening in places like Wisconsin affects not just Wisconsin, but the whole country as well. Finally, of course, talking about Mandela Barnes, the lieutenant governor, could become Wisconsin's first black U.S. senator if he defeats Republican incumbent Ron Johnson in November. During the protests in Kenosha, Wisconsin, in 2020, we spoke to Barnes and asked him what's being done at the state level around police reform. We introduced, um, or the governor introduced, uh, a legislative package. Now, we know that a legislative package is not going to solve the deep problems, but it takes a coordinated effort. We need action at every level of government. Reimagining what, uh, what keeping people safe looks like. It goes to making sure uh, that there is funding on the front end to prevent violence from happening in the first place, like violence interrupters, but also having support for community organizations, having support for job training programs, uh, you know, whatever, whatever the case may be, to create communities, to create societies where people have an opportunity to thrive, where less or fewer police are actually needed to respond to anything in the first place. So that's Mandela Barnes, who could become the first black senator from Wisconsin in the U.S. Senate. But if you could comment overall on this race as you travel through Wisconsin and what else you're looking at in this pivotal election year. Well, first off, Amy, I think it's important to note that criminal justice reform was very popular in Wisconsin. It was introduced before the legislature, and the heavily gerrymandered legislature took no action on it. So the lack of criminal justice reform in Wisconsin is also a victim of gerrymandering. But Republicans are absolutely hammering Mandela Barnes on defund the police. When I was there, there were ads over and over by Ron Johnson's campaign saying Mandela Barnes wanted to defund the police. That's not true. They've twisted his words. But I think the idea is that they're trying to make the election of the first black senator in Wisconsin seem like something that's scary and dangerous, and that's gonna to lead to more crime. So I think they're absolutely running a, a very racist campaign against Mandela Barnes there uh, by Ron Johnson. I think it is hurting Mandela Barnes, and he has a difficult time to become a U.S. senator to try to counteract these attacks. Uh, but it's a very, very uh, close state. And so what I'm looking at is not just the U.S. Senate. I'm looking at whether um, Tony Evers, the, the Democratic governor, will get reelected. And I'm looking at whether Republicans will get supermajorities in the legislature or not. Uh, so I think there's a lot of races in Wisconsin that are really important. I think it's a microcosm of the country writ large, where these state races have a tremendous importance. And they have a tremendous importance affecting not just state politics, but national politics as well. Ari Berman, I want to thank you for being with us, senior reporter for Mother Jones. We'll link to your piece, How Wisconsin Became the GOP's Laboratory for Dismantling Democracy. Ari is author of Give Us the Ballot, The Modern Struggle for Voting Rights in America. Coming up, we go to Florida, to voting rights activist Desmond Mead and how Republican Governor Ron DeSantis is attempting to scare formerly incarcerated people away from voting by using his newly formed election police force to arrest people on trumped-up voter fraud charges. Back in 30 seconds. by Fleetwood Mac. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman.
We look now at how Republicans are still trying to scare former felons away from voting, even as trumped-up charges of voter fraud in past elections have been dismissed in the lead-up to the November 8th midterm elections. It was March 2020, Super Tuesday, when Hervis Rogers was interviewed by CNN's Ed Lavendera as he stood in line with other voters in Houston, Texas. Why did you wait this long to vote? Because I wanted, I figured like it was my duty to vote. I want to get my vote in, to voice my opinion, and I wasn't going to let nothing stop me. So I waited it out. We waited for about six hours, about six hours, a little bit over six hours. That interview with Rogers went viral. A year later, he was charged with felony voter fraud for voting when he was ineligible while on felony parole. Last week, a district court judge in Texas set aside his indictment, which was brought by the Republican Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton, who's running for re-election and supports former Trump's claims of the 2020 election was stolen. Days later, Paxton launched a 2022 so-called election integrity team. This comes after a legal setback in Florida for Republican Governor Ron DeSantis also running for re-election. Last Friday, a Miami man arrested under DeSantis's newly formed Florida Office of Election Crimes and Security had its charges dismissed. Floridians voted in 2018 to allow formerly incarcerated people with past felony convictions to cast ballots, excluding those convicted of murder or felony sex offenses. Robert Lee Wood was among 20 mostly black voters arrested in August who said they were encouraged to vote by Florida officials and were not made aware of this exclusion, which is not stated on voter registration forms. Police body cam footage shows how people seem puzzled by their arrests and didn't intend to run afoul of the law. This is Tampa resident Ramona Oliver being arrested. Oh my God, hold on. Wait, wait. Let me tell my husband. Wait, wait, we're yeah, telling him. He's right here. Right here. So if you could put your hands on your back, please. Oh my God. Do so, not move. Ultimately, ma'am, you have a warrant? Okay. The warrant. No. Well, listen, hold on. Listen. I know you're hey, you caught off guard. I understand. Right? So you have a warrant. It's for voter fraud. Okay. Hear me out. It's an ROR. You know what an ROR is? Oh my God. You go in, you get booked, and then they're going to release you from booking. You can go right out. You're going to be right back out. Okay? Right out, right back but out. you have a warrant. Okay. Yep. I'm like, voter fraud? I voted, but I ain't fought, commit no fraud. Well, yeah, so th going. that's the thing. I, I don't know exactly what happened with it, but you, you do have a warrant. That's what it's for. Okay. Oh my God. Yeah. For more, we're joined in Orlando, Florida, by Desmond Mead, president of the Florida Vo Rights Restoration Coalition and chairman of Floridians for a Fair Democracy. He spearheaded Amendment 4, which reenfranchised 1.4 million Floridians. His latest book is titled Let My People Vote, My Battle to Restore the Civil Rights of Returning Citizens. Welcome back to Democracy Now!, Desmond. Um, as we watch this video and this woman saying, oh, my God, can you talk about the 20 or so Floridians who were just arrested by the so-called election integrity, the election police force that DeSantis has uh, just created? Well, good morning, Amy. Thank you so much for having me on the show. You know, I'm looking at the video and, and just hearing this woman speak, and it just infuriates me, you know, and, and almost like getting re-traumatized again. And thinking about those 20 people, you know, some of whom were uh, arrested by SWAT teams, right, and, and having helicopters over their homes as if they are Pablo Escobar or something, you know, and, and each one of these individuals terrified, some being drug out their home in the middle of the night, still in their pajamas, wouldn't even, wouldn't even be allowed to, to, to get into regular clothes. And to think all because of the state's failure uh, to have a, a system in place that could assure any American citizen that lives in the state of Florida whether or not they're eligible to vote. And so it's, it's, very, it's, it's very infuriating. Um, and, and I know that, you know, you, we talk about, you know, the, 
the impact, the chilling impact that this can have on, on especially returning citizen voters. And sadly, Amy, the damage has already been done. Uh, right now, we're forced to try to mitigate those damages uh, by responding to these arrests. Desmond, uh, just clarify your terms. Explain what you mean, and you consider yourself a returning citizen, by this term, returning citizens. I'm glad you asked that, Amy. You know, returning citizen is uh, youth interchangeably with justice-impacted people or people who've had previous fel uh, felony convictions uh, who've been impacted by the criminal justice system. Uh, we tend to, to shy away from using the word felon because that is a dehumanizing term. And, and uh, unfortunately, you know, this, this country is accustomed to using that word. But when you do that, you, you kind of lose the humanity in, in some of these stories. You know, when you show that gentleman that was excited about being able to vote and was willing to stand in line for hours to do so, right, that's the human part of it. And I really appreciate you for showing that, right? But it reminds me even of the young man who was investigated for voting fraud, talking about how he's, he's been hidden away from society for so long. And when he was told by the supervisor of elections that he was eligible to vote, how he felt like, you know, he was finally part of society. And these are the stories that we have to uplift, because it's more about the people and less about the politics. Talk about how you felt when you were able then to vote and why this was so important to you. I mean, let me tell you, you know, and, and it's, I know it's hard for people to wrap their head around, but I really do believe that when we talk about voting, it actually transcends partisan politics. I know every time we say voting, it's, it's within a conversation about Democrats and Republicans. But when I went to vote for the first time in my very first presidential election in 2020, you know, I didn't feel as if I was voting as a Democrat or a Republican or even as an African American. What I felt I was doing was engaging in an act that, that validated my existence on this planet, that, that validated my existence within a society, that my voice matters, right? And, and it was such a, a, a sacred experience uh, that I felt, and, and it really drove home why we were so adamant in fighting for everyone, every returning citizen, having an opportunity to participate in our democracy and how important everyone's participation is to our democracy in order for our democracy to be more vibrant and thriving. I mean, it's not just returning citizens who are excited about voting. The state of Florida, um, you spearheaded Amendment 4. It overwhelmingly passed. But then can you talk about how the Republican-led legislature tried to restrict what the people of Florida, Democrat, Republican, Independent, voted for? You actually, Desmond Mead, had very little resistance in this amendment that enabled, what, something like 1.4 million more Floridians to vote. Yeah, and you're right, Amy. You know, just I think your your previous guest alluded to it that, you know, we're in a time now in this country where you have elected officials that are 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 blatantly ignoring the will of the people. You know, here in Florida, the people clearly spoke, you know, and we had a very beautiful moment when we passed Amendment 4 because we had people from all walks of life and all political persuasions, Democrats, Republicans, independents. Matter of fact, over a million people who voted for Governor DeSantis also voted for Amendment 4. However, you know, I believe since the, the formation of this country, there's always been a select group of politicians who would much rather pick and choose who get to vote for them as opposed to letting everyone have a say in how their country is governed. As a matter of fact, it hasn't been too long since uh, women were given the right to vote. There was a time in this country when there were politicians that, that uh, strenuously believed that women should not be able to have a say in how this country is ran. And they were willing to abuse women. They were willing to uh, incarcerate women to prevent them from having a say. And this is the same thing that we're seeing right now. So, Desmond Mead, let's go back to this arrest of the 20 people, um, almost all African American, who were arrested. And what they were told—I mean, to be very clear here, this is more than arresting them. It sends a message to people who've been incarcerated or not in Florida, you better watch out. If you vote, you might be arrested, whether or not later on the charges get dropped. But the idea that 
In fact, a number of them did not think they could vote, but they were told, don't worry about it, sign up, and if you can't, you won't be able to vote, you'll be told. Yes, you're perfectly right, you know, Amy. I tell folks that there's a bigger story within the story that's told, you know. Uh, you know, prior to the August arrest, there were some arrests in April, I think, in, in Alachua County. And in this particular case, you had 10 men that were arrested. Uh, some were, were drug out of uh, homeless shelters. There was a grandfather that was arrested in front of his grandkids. And these gentlemen were all told by a supervisor of election that it was okay for them to register to vote, and they did, right? And, and, and what we're seeing is that, when, and we know that there is probably hundreds, even thousands more individuals that are facing a, a, a possibility of being arrested or even prosecuted. At the end of the day, you know, we've, we've always stated that the burden is on the state. When a person fills out a voter registration form, even a third-party voter registration organization, when they help someone register to vote, it is not their responsibility to ensure that that person uh, is a totally a qualified voter. They do not have the resources that the state have, right? And so those applications are then sent to the Secretary of State whose responsibility it is to run the, the, the applications through whatever various systems it have to, to ensure whether or not that person is a qualified voter. If that person is not qualified, then the Secretary of State would not issue a voter identification card. However, if, if that person is qualified, the state would send that person a voter identification card. And when that person receives that card, there is no other option but to believe that they are a legitimate voter, right? Because if you can't rely on, on the state to give you assurances about whether or not you can vote, then who else can you rely on? I'm looking at a New York Times piece about one of the people arrested, Larry, um, named Robert Lee Wood, who received a voter card from Florida six or seven weeks after filling out the application, and then he gets arrested. So, can you talk, as we wrap up, Desmond Mead, about how many people who are formerly imprisoned um, do have the right to vote in this country who's, uh, who may not know this, or just what is the population we're talking about? Well, let me tell you about Florida, because Florida is such a pivotal state. You know, there's over 600,000 returning citizens that are living in Florida right now that are eligible to register to vote and participate in elections, right? But they face the challenge of, number one, the, the chaos surrounding the payment of fines and fees uh, that, that, that kind of discourages them from even trying to vote. And then now you have these arrests. One very important thing, though, I want to note, Amy, is that I remember when there was a raid on, in, in Mar-a-Lago, in President uh, Trump's home, how some people were questioning the timing of the FBI raid, saying that it's suspicious that they would raid two years uh, before the presidential election. And now, my statement to them is that if people are concerned about the timing two years off, Right here in Florida, these arrests started on the eve of, 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 of elections, right? Whether it was the primary election that we had in August, right? And now, of course, the general election that we have here in November. And so these arrests are, are, are frighteningly close to election, and it, is, it can't be other, any other uh, 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 conclusion to make other than that this is an intimidating tactic. Uh, to scare people away from participating in our democracy. And so folks need to be outraged at this. Folks need to, to fight back. And one of the ways they can do this, Amy, is that we've set up bail funds for these individuals, and we've set up a legal defense fund. The gentleman that you talked about whose case was dropped, we were able to provide an attorney for this young man so he's able to successfully challenge uh, these charges in court. We and we're providing seconds, attorneys Desmond. for any individual who are arrested on these charges. And we're making sure that people are also able to bail out if they cannot afford to post bail. Desmond Mead, we want to thank you for being with us, president of the Florida Rights Restoration Coalition, chair of the Floridians for a Fair Democracy. Tune in November 8th for our three-hour election night special beginning at 9 Eastern. I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks so much.